Hey everyone, I'm your host Anthony. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to our live class. We're very excited to have you here and looking forward to a great lecture. My name is Anthony and I'll be your host for today. I'm joined on the line by Lisa McDonald, the founder of Integrated Connections, who will be conducting most of the presentation. I'll pass it off to her momentarily to kick off today's topic, HR 101 for Functional and Integrative Medicine Practices. But before we get started, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping rules. I've muted everyone by default. And secondly, if you have any questions during the course of this live class, please submit them in the chat panel. The questions will all come to me as the host, and I will be conducting a live Q&A with our presenter at the end of the presentation. With that said, I'd like to pass it off to Lisa to start the presentation. Thanks, Anthony, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share what I know about HR today. Uh, that's probably one of the funnest things for me to do is take the knowledge that I've learned over the years and give it to others to help them. And uh, first of all, let's look about my background so you have an understanding of who I am and the knowledge that I am bringing with me. I started Integrated Connections in 2009. And when I started it, it was for recruitment only in this field. And then we grew a job board and then we've added an HR center. So prior to that, I had 20 years of HR experience or well, not quite at that point, but I definitely have over that now. And I was in two different industries prior, uh, manufacturing and finance. and. I, you know, was very sick and functional and integrative medicine got me better, fell in love with it, knew I had to support this movement. So I knew I couldn't go to medical school. So I decided to use my HR management background and start um, a company that I could help support the practices in the field. And I thought that's how I could best serve. So that's a little bit about the history um, of how I came to be here. And since I've had the company, I've also partnered on a job board with the Institute for Functional Medicine. And we joined that in 2016. And throughout this whole 12 years, I've had the privilege of recruiting for small practices, health systems, academia. So I've got firsthand knowledge of what it takes to manage people, keep compliant in HR, how to hire, how to recruit, all of that. And I've also seen that there are a lot of mistakes that are being made, um, a lot of opportunities missed. And so I always see where there's a need and try to fill that. And that's why I launched this HR support center that really is intended to continue the support I can provide all of the practices in the field because you know, it's just so critical to have you to transform our healthcare system. And a little bit of my own housekeeping. I just want to make sure everybody understands that I'm giving you guidance and information today. It's not legal advice, just general information, but you will walk away. I promise you'll walk away with something, whether you're just going to start a practice, you're growing your practice, you've been in it for a while, there will be something that will be of value you, for you today. And that is, um, you know, I, I set that intention and I know that that will happen. So to get us started, I want to talk about what is HR. And you can see on a lot of sitcoms and things like that, that HR is often referred to as a place that you want to file a complaint, you know, and, but it's so much more than that. You know, here's some of the things that the areas of managing employees at HR is involved in. It's recruiting and staffing, it's comp and benefits, it's training and learning, it's employee relations, it's organizational development. And I worked in large corporations where we would have a department for recruiting or some places uh, would be one person as a recruiter, one person did comp and benefits, one person was organizational development because HR is that complex. There's so many intricacies of, in HR that they, we had to have that many people involved in it. So HR has really become sort of this umbrella term that encompasses so much and so much that's so critical to having an efficient practice that I want to make sure that you're aware of that because it is the foundation to building your medical practice. When you started to build it or you're thinking about it now, you know you need to get um, supplements, a, a plan figured out. Maybe you're going to do online dispensary for that. You knew that Rupa was the best place for you to get the online labs done and you know that those are like the building blocks. I can't start my practice till I have 
those efficiencies in place of managing my supplements for my patients, ordering their labs. And also you need to include HR as one of those building blocks because it maximizes the potential of your practice. So as we go through this, I'll be explaining more and more why it's so important to have that building block in place so that you have a successful practice. So in the webinar, we'll talk about why it's important to have that foundation. I will explain how you can establish HR processes that make you an employer of choice in the field. We're gonna talk a lot about how important it is to retain those top employers. We'll talk about tips that's going to make it really easy for you to maximize HR and your medical practice because it can be overwhelming. And I'm coming at this as a, an HR professional who's been in it for a long time and it is complex, but I have, through the years found that there's ways to make it simple so that you aren't intimidated to make sure that you are managing your employees appropriately, that you're engaged with them. There is a simple way to make sure that you are compliant with all of this. So I broke it out into thinking about the employee life cycle and how HR impacts every part of it. And it starts with what I think, you know, hiring, there's three stages, hiring, keeping them, and when you're saying goodbye to them. So the first life cycle, when you're bringing them on, you're going to want to have job descriptions uh, developed for that position. You want to make sure you have your compensation and ranges determined, the job posts that are going to go out, interview processes in place, how you'll extend offers, and the onboarding process. And then it impacts retaining them. So you want to maximize the potential of your employees, which is, you know, they're, they're part of like, they are, I think, your most valuable asset. And how are you going to develop and manage and keep them? What kind of policies will you have in place? How will you establish training and performance management? Because one of the things that I really want to emphasize is that performance management isn't just about trying to get rid of somebody. It's about bringing the best out in that person. It's about correcting behavior that you see right away so you can improve that. And then it also is involved in saying goodbye to them, whether it's an involuntary or a voluntary leave. So within all of the employee life cycle, you need to stay compliant. And this is why. If you aren't compliant, then it can really be a big cost to your practice. So this is just a few statistics I pulled to give you an idea of the impact that noncompliance can have. There's $160,000 is the average cost of a small business employment lawsuit. And that can take up to a year to resolve. And what I've seen in my career is it could take more than a year to resolve. Uh, potential penalty, penalty for wage and hour violation under the FLSA is $10,000. The amount of violation of uh, an ADA uh, is a $75,000 potential cost to an employer. And a potential fine for each violation of $1,000 when you violate the minimum wage or overtime pay requirements. And you might think that, well, how often does anybody file a complaint? I'm a small business. This isn't going to happen for me. So I wanted to pull something from 2018 to show you it does happen quite often because in 2018, there were over 76,000 discrimination and harassment charges filed with the EEOC. And there was a $505 million cost in settlements to US companies that year. So it does happen and it can be a significant cost in your practice. So you wanna make sure that you're compliant. That's why one of the reasons HR is so important, it helps you stay compliant so that you never have to worry about some fine like this. So let's go back to that life cycle and we'll start with the first thing in um, hiring, that first stage that we talked about. So if you're trying to maximize the potential of your practice, you need to put a lot of thought into who you're hiring and how you're hiring because a single bad, bad hire can cost you $50,000 in lost productivity. You think about the rehiring, the onboarding and the training. And it's interesting because I just spoke with someone in a really large health system and they said, no, it's way more than that. It's way more if we're replacing a physician. And so it's a difficult figure to really nail exactly what it costs. But I think that the $50,000 is just how I'm trying to express to you that it's a significant impact if you do not hire right. And if even if you're talking about your front office person, um, if the time it would take into hiring the right person for that, training for the, them for that, your patients get used to that person, they get used to your patients, you're dealing with chronically ill people who are coming to a place to heal 
And as a functional medicine patient, I can tell you how important it is every time I walked into my practice, into my healing place and the people that were there. And if there's a lot of turnover, even that front office person is going to impact how we as a patient feel and we come in wondering, oh, this person's not here anymore, why? Or why is there so much turnover at that front desk? Why aren't they able to retain them? So start thinking from the very beginning of your hiring foundation, um, how you're going to do it right. You know, I, and this, this is an example of our job board right there. And I see so many practices say, I've got a waiting list of 12 weeks, six months. I need to hire a clinician right now. I need to hire extra staff right now. And they just slap up a job posting and they're not really ready to hire because they didn't lay that foundation first. And so I want to talk about some steps that you want to take in your hiring foundation. And I put determined compensation as the first thing to really start thinking about, which in years past, I actually had job description listed as first, but I have recently talked to several practice owners that were having conversations with me about their job posting, but they really didn't even understand the cost involved with hiring for that person. And so the first thing I would recommend that you do is, what can I afford? You can find salary information online in different places. Um, you know, Glassdoor can talk about, uh, you know, either medical practices, et cetera, or you go to Indeed or salary.com or Payscale. So you can get an idea, even if you're looking for your medical assistant, if you're looking for your health coach or et cetera, you can get a, a general idea of what you should expect in paying that person. So once you know I can't afford to hire, then start developing that job description. And I've also seen a lot of people not do that. And they think, well, it's a new position and we'll develop it as we go. That is not what you wanna do. That job description is so important to what you hold them to as far as expectations, what you are presenting to them when they're coming on. I mean, I just, we'll go through that a little bit more, but I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to put these steps in place to build this foundation before you even get that job posting up. Because once you start getting the candidates coming in, you want to engage with them timely and you want to be prepared to do that. Because if you don't already know what that job is, how can you talk to that candidate about it? And by developing a job description, you're going to know exactly what you need in that practice, what that job will be, and how you're going to present it to that candidate and what you're going to hold them to, how you're going to hold them accountable. And the next thing I talk about there is behavioral interview questions. And these are so important in the vetting process because you want to make sure that you are screening for the people who are right for your practice. And behavioral interview questions are one, ones that try to dig and find out how a candidate performed in a previous situation because past behavior is the best predictor of future performance. And so if you develop ones that say, you know, tell me about a time when or something like that, then you are going to see how they handled that patient interaction, how they um, were, you know, an experience of when they were under duress, how they did that. I ask one a lot about um, how they solve uh, tough clinical situations, medical detective type things, you know. I want to see how they think through a complex medical issue, the steps that they take, the judgment that they used, and they are really eye-opening once you develop some of those good questions, and they also will start to engage you in some more probing as to going through when you get those. So make sure that you take time to write questions and use that job description as you're developing them because you know what you want them to do in that job, what you're holding them accountable for. You're developing questions that are going to vet and screen for what you're looking for. And I also want to add in something here, and I, I say it a lot, about that you want to really think about hiring for character and personality and emotional intelligence. Because I know everybody would love to hire the certified functional medicine person, the fellowship in integrative medicine, and that's absolutely great. You should want to hire that. And I always tell candidates, get that because it'll set you apart. But at the end of the day, you have to make sure that they fit in the culture of your practice, that they are somebody that is going to complement your team um, because you can teach skill sets for the person who has the initiative, the dedication, and the passion, but you can't teach personality and you can't teach the, some of the things of emotional intelligence and character. So again, developing interview questions, probing for all that is going to help set you up for success in your hiring process. I also encourage you not to be alone when you do it. 
uh, I and anything to, in with HR, I think having one other person is really helpful for a lot of reasons. For interviews, it's because uh, I, you know, you might miss something. Every person has a different perspective that they bring when they're an interviewer, and you want to hear what they captured from some comment or what they thought. And it's such a great way to really screen somebody when you get more than just your own perspective when you're interviewing somebody. But it's so, so important that they're trained. And we'll talk about that as well as how to stay compliant in these interviews. But you cannot bring someone into that interview process unless they absolutely understand what's appropriate to ask and how to stay compliant in those questions. And make sure that you have a consistent vetting process. So the biggest thing that um, I have noticed is people will change their questions once in a while based off of um, how the interview is going. And that's not a great idea because, and this is a word you're gonna hear me say throughout this, consistency. If you aren't consistent and you're not treating people fairly, you can set yourself up for some potential risk. But if you have a consistent vetting process and every candidate has the same question asked of them, then you are going to be compliant that way. And it's also a great way to compare the way they answer the same question. So consistent vetting process is really critical to having a compliant interview process. I wanna talk about remote staff a little bit because right now I think it's about, there's like 38% more people participating in telehealth than prior to COVID. And I know that a lot of our practices are pivoting to remote and virtual and a lot of the labor force wants to work remote right now in healthcare too, not just you know other industries, but not everyone is cut out for remote work. And a lot of people want it right now, but unfortunately not everybody can work independently and be as productive. So when you are hiring for your remote staff, highly encourage you to create interview questions that screen for people who are self-motivated. They're able to work independently they can manage their time skills and they have excellent communication skills because they have to be able to communicate with your patients through telehealth efficiently and also with your team. So make sure that when you develop questions that you're using in your video interviews, you're screening for that. Think about if you're hiring a health coach, you, they have to motivate your patients. So make sure that they have their own self-motivation down as well. It's, you know, there's so much more that goes into trying to communicate with people virtually. When you're interviewing for those remote positions, highly encourage you to create questions that are going to screen for the people who can do it effectively. So when you have that remote hiring process, you're setting up your vid video interviews, you're making sure you have your online forms. So if their application process is going to be online and you're looking at that, if you have other interviewers helping you and they're not where you are and they're remote, get all that nailed down. Make sure you've got your remote hiring process really nailed down and in place because you're presenting yourself as this employer who knows what they are doing. And also you wanna make sure that you are very compliant because it is different when you're hiring for remote in regards to state laws, for example, uh, let me give you an example on that. Uh, let's, oh, if you are hiring in California, but you're located in Colorado, then you're going to have to be aware of all the laws associated with California laws and how you're going to speak with them about um, taxes or things that are, of. Oh, here's a better example. Let me do this one, Colorado, which is where I happen to be located. We currently in Colorado have a state law that if you post a job, you have to include the salary range, the comp information in that job posting. So you need to make sure that if you're gonna post a job in the United States and you are going to hire for someone in Colorado, you're compliant with the state of Colorado for that. Also, there are a lot of states that have a salary ban in place, which means you are not allowed to ask for the salary history of a candidate. The intent behind that is trying to get rid of the wage gap disparity. And so what I do as a recruiter is I just never ask it because instead of trying to keep up to date on which state allows me to ask and which state does not, I just am complying across the board. I make sure it's safe. And I ask a candidate, can you tell me what your salary requirement is? 
Um, there's also different new higher reporting requirements for each state. And so you'll need to, when you do bring that person on, you're going to want to find out for whatever state they are located in, what is the requirement and how I report that new hire. The other thing I want to talk about is I-9s. Uh, just because they're remote, you still have to maintain them and you want to be compliant with how you're doing that as well. And then also um, state and county taxes. And that can get kind of tricky too, because if some of the states have county tax as well. So there's a lot that goes into hiring for remote employees that I think sometimes people may forget. And the last thing is on salary. If I'm in Colorado and I'm hiring for a virtual position, but I'm interviewing a candidate in the Bay Area, then I need to be prepared to talk about how my range is appropriate for maybe the Colorado, is it going to fit that, um, the demographics, et cetera, for the Bay Area. Uh, you just have to have that really well thought out because when you're presenting to a candidate, they're watching everything that you do. They're looking at how you're handling every bit of that hiring process to see what kind of an employer you are. Um, are you organized? Are you efficient? Have you thought this all out? Is this a stable opportunity? Everything that happens at this point on is being judged just like you're judging them through that whole interview process. Just a good reminder that they're judging you as well. And some simple tips to help you be compliant in that recruiting process. Make sure that you and your interviewers that are involved don't ask any questions that focus anything about age or disability, nothing about race, religion, sex, marital status, na national origin. None of that has anything to do with if their ability to do the job. Here's some examples um, of what not to ask. When do you in intend to retire? Because that could refer to an age claim. Um, how are you managing your lupus? And you know, I, I want to spend a second on that because so many people in our field got in the field because they did have a serious health issue. They got better, they got inspired, they wanted to practice this medicine and help other people. So I have candidates disclose a lot of medical information to me in interviews. I never include that in my written summary. And I also will let them know that, you know, I appreciate that story, but I'm not going to present that to the employer, you know, because I consider that part of your medical history. I'm just going to express to them that you have a lot of passion for this. And so I refer back to um, why are they so passionate, how they showed it, right? That past behavior thing again. And I include in my summary things that I, if they start telling me about pod, I always talk about education. Like I am big about the education. If they're pursuing it, if they've got a certification, what they're doing there. Sometimes they may not have all that. They want to get it. They can't afford it. But these people are listening to podcasts. And a lot of people who've gotten themselves better have read books, podcasts, gone to conferences. So I focus on that. That's the information I want to present to my employer. Look at the initiative that they took to learn functional medicine. They truly want to do this. They listen to, you know, I could list all the podcasts we're familiar with, and they've read these books, and then they've even attended these conferences, but they don't mention anything about their medical issue. Don't ask them if they're starting to plan a family. Um, in my long ago days, I was actually, as an HR person, was asked that question, and it was quite shocking for me. Of course, you don't want to ask what country they're from, their national origin or anything. It doesn't matter. And what is your salary history? And you may be in a state right now that says, hey, Lisa, I just checked, and we don't have the salary ban in our state yet. I am just all about making it simple. I think that it could change in your state. Like literally I get state law alerts often and things are changing rapidly. So for me, I just play it safe. I just don't ask for that. I don't want them to ever um, perceive that I'm asking something that could be perceived as a wage gap issue, right? So just don't ask, what is their requirement? You've done your research. You know what a competitive salary range is for the job you are hiring. You are so prepared. Ask them their salary requirement and see if it's within that range. And make sure, again, consistent. And I'm going to keep dropping these throughout it, but that consistency th thing is so, so key to that. Same questions and a structured interview process. So once you have interview questions developed, you're going to have a process laid out as well. And it's going to make you look like such a top-notch employer that you've developed questions, you have a system down, the first one's a video interview. If it goes really well and you follow up with them, maybe it's an on-site interview. On that next on-site interview, your whole staff is ready and knows that we have a candidate coming on site to interview with us. 
We want to present to them the top employer that we are. Here is a schedule that we have determined. They'll spend, you know, they'll greet the front office at this time. We'll start with so-and-so at this time. We'll go to lunch at this time. You know, if you give them that schedule and the office knows about it ahead of time and you know the follow-up questions you and your team are going to ask and you treat them, you know, with such uh, an open heart and um, interest, it's going to be a great interview process. Here's a simple tip so that you don't get overwhelmed and I don't want anyone to leave this being scared to start their own practice because you shouldn't be. There's tons of support out there to help you through it. And a simple thing is if it isn't related to the job, just don't ask it. So when you train your support person who's going to maybe your practice manager and yourself, if it isn't related to the job, don't ask it. It's such a simple thing to keep in mind and it really will help you be compliant in all your interviews. So you've done this great interview process, you've found this incredible candidate, you can't wait to hire them, and now you're ready to offer them the job. Uh, this is so important that you think about how you're going to make that job offer because you want, you're welcoming, welcoming them to your team. It's like another family. You want it to be formal. You want it to be with a lot of enthusiasm. It has to uh, show them that, hey, you might be leaving this other job. Like, what if you're trying to recruit somebody from a really large organization into your new practice? A lot of people are scared to make that jump. They might not think it's secure. Uh, they might feel like, oh, I don't know if this is, you know, I don't know if that's the right move for me right now. Well, let them know that, hey, look, I am a really organized employer. I've taken you through this really strong interview process, and now I'm ready to make you an offer. And it is going to be a formal offer with an offer letter that clearly states all the terms of employment so that if there's any kind of negotiating to take place and you're going back and forth, you have it in that letter and that they can bring it. It's a legal document, but they feel like it's so professional that this is a really organized process. And you know what? I actually want to talk about the salary and, and you can communicate because you have a legal document to look at to do so. You can put in there all the things that are required of them. So there's never a question about it. That offer letter is so important to have. And I also have a couple other things to mention, and that is an NDA and a non-compete. And I think it's important to our field to have those because a lot of people might have certain protocols that they feel like are you know, privy to just their practice, something they've developed personally and they may not wanna share and they wanna protect that. And also non-competes. And I've seen some deals fall through on non-competes. And that's why I wanted to mention that. Think about where you are. If you're in a rural area, then a wider radius of a non-compete of 25 miles or something may make sense. But if you're in a big city, uh, you know, that wouldn't make sense. And it can really push people off. So think about those things before you present it. What is a realistic non-compete for your practice? And when you bring them on, you're going to have a wonderful pro process for doing that. You're going to have all their new hire paperwork in order. If it's a remote employee, it'll be digital. I mean, we're digitizing everything now. Everything is available in the world to hire remotely. Make sure you got that in place. And you want to absolutely make sure you have a handbook and that job description. Because if you have an employee handbook in place, then they will know everything that's expected of them. They will know everything about your practice. In our HR support center, um, it takes less than 30 minutes to go in and develop a handbook. And some of the questions that ask you in there is like, what's your vision? You know, And I think those things are really, really important to share with that new employee. What do you see for this? Um, what do you see for your practice? Make them feel like they're part of some incredible movement here, you know, because they are. And that what is your vision? What are you trying to do with your practice in your area? How are you, you know, you're healing people. How are you doing that? You're transforming lives and you're including that in there and it's in your handbook. You also have in the handbook other expectations you want to hold them accountable to. If you have any kind of a policy, well, you absolutely should have a policy about if they, um, how much they miss work, if they're showing up late to work things like that. And the job description for our field, I think is so, it's important for every job, but so for ours so much so because it's always evolving. And if you're a small practice, you're always changing. And so the description doesn't have to have every minute detail of every single thing that they do. In fact, our template has a, you know, a paragraph about that this can change and it's not all inclusive, et cetera, but it's a description you're gonna revisit. 
because you want to come back as the job evolves, especially if you're a new practice. Sometimes they're wearing, wearing more hats than usual and they're learning different things. And you might need to come back and say, hey, we've added these other responsibilities. I'm going to update your job description and they're going to sign that. And then when they're onboarding, um, I, you've probably already seen a stat below about 69% of employees who undergo effective onboarding are more likely to stay with an employer for at least three years. So important to see that because I have talked to so many candidates who on the first day showed up and they really didn't have a physical space ready for them. Um, they didn't have a schedule for them. They didn't have a mentor and they had called and said, I think I may have made a mistake. You certainly don't want that to happen. You've put a lot of time and effort into hiring someone that you want to be a part of your team. So that first day, they should have an orientation schedule. They should know exactly what they're going to be doing that day because it's pretty scary being new, a new employee. And you want to make them the least scared as possible. And I always think about this too. You will be a topic of conversation at the dinner table, right? Is their employer, is their manager, whatever that is, what kind of impact do you want to have on them? When, they, um, when they're at your practice, that impact influences how they treat your patients. And when they go home, it influences how they treat their family. So from the day one, onboard them and make them feel like this is the greatest job you're going to have. We are so excited to have you. Here's where you're going to start the day. Who's, here's who your mentor is. Here's a schedule we're going to outline for you to make sure that you feel like you have things going. So that is now step two of our life cycle. We've got to keep them. you got them. You've put a lot into hiring them, vetting them, getting them all situated to start and uh, jumpstart a great career. Now we have to keep them. And one of those things is performance management. And that is growing and reviewing that job description regularly as they grow. So make sure that there is something in the handbook about when you will offer uh, performance reviews, and you should absolutely be doing them. If you have one employee, you should still be doing a performance review. You are responsible for that employee's development, um, for holding them accountable to what you expect of them and letting them know and letting them know the expectations and if they're meeting those expectations. So make sure that you sit down at the time of the performance review and say, hey, let's look at your job description. Wow, your job has really evolved since you started here and the practice has grown. Let's put some of that in there and et cetera, et cetera. And if there is a performance issue, you got to address it timely, because if you don't, it's obviously going to escalate and it could get out of control when if you did it early on, you have an opportunity to correct behavior and an opportunity to help somebody develop and an opportunity to retain a valuable employee. So I know that it gets super busy. I know, I mean, all of us do, but I think when you're in patient care, even more so, but it's so critical to take out that time. If you see an issue, address it right then and make sure that you document any time that you do. So another thing I want to talk about is investing in learning and development because 94 of employees said that they would stay with their employer longer if the employer had invested in their education. Think about that with a general statistic from across all industries. What do you think it would be for our field? Because learning is so, so important. So I know some of you might just be getting off the ground and you can't afford to cover CME for them, but you can still do lunch and learns. I bet there are some of the lab companies that would be love to come in and talk to your people and present information to them. You could even rotate within the staff and say, hey, what if you take this topic and come and talk to us and I'll bring lunch in and we'll learn about that. There are so many ways that you can continue the growth and education with not necessarily spending the money. So think about that. That is a great way to retain your employees, especially in our field. And I want to make sure that you recognize them. Um, that I think all of us want to be appreciated. And the employee, it's so critical to do that. Think of ways that you're going to do it. Doesn't always have to be monetary. And then collaboration. In that piece, uh, that is one of the things I hear most in our field is from clinicians who say, I don't want to be on an island of one anymore. You're dealing with complex medical issues. You are, um, you know, we're in a movement that isn't widely accepted and we want support. We need each other and your team needs to be able to collaborate together. So make sure that you have thought that out. How am I going to have a spirit of collaboration where they support each other, they lean on each other, that they know that they aren't on an island of one. 
And I should mention that, that there's a little job description template that um, we have in our center because I think when I say all these things that are so familiar to me, it probably could be overwhelming to you. So when you have to develop a handbook, you have to develop a job description, you don't have to start from scratch. You know, we've got building blocks out there that can just launch you into doing it and making it super easy. Now I'm gonna go back to managing the virtual employees because that is so common right now. It's, you have to put more thought into how you're going to create that collaborative environment for them virtually. So think about when were we gonna have our virtual team meetings? What platforms am I going to use for those? Are you going to use Zoom or Google? You know, have all that thought out, have those systems in place, make sure your new employees have those loaded into their computers and say, hey, we use Zoom, or here's when our meetings are. Um, make sure that you are leading by example through all of it. So you've gotta be familiar with all of the systems. You've gotta be able to speak to that. You know, another thing I just thought of is internal messaging. I know Slack is often used. What, how are you gonna communicate easily internally with your employees? Think through those things. Um, and the other thing that lead by example, I know for me, I have a hard time shutting it off, but I also own my company and I consider it my third child. I have two kids and my company. And so I have a tendency sometimes to work hours that I would never expect of my employees. And I noticed that one of them, I would be emailing on a weekend or something and she responded and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. That is not an expectation I have of you because I want them to have a break. I want them to recharge. I don't want them to ever think that they need to follow sometimes the example that I'm, you know, I, I don't love the, the hours that I work, but the reality is when you start your own business, it's kind of a part of it. And um, it, it's just, it's my third kid. So I do. You could, if you are one of those people who likes to work at 1 a.m. and shoot out emails, you could put one of those timers on your email or just be upfront with them and let them know, hey, this is when I catch up. It's, you know, I'm a night owl. Don't you worry if you get a 1 a.m. email from me. That's just what, that's what I do to stay on top of everything, you know, because in the handbook or in the offer letter, you've already got their hours and their expectations nailed down. And then being flexible and adjust as needed. When we first all started going remote um, with the pandemic, it was constantly changing and constantly trying to figure it out. And so letting them know that you are always evolving. Our field is always evolving. We're always growing. And for me, I love uh, Kaizen. It's a continuous improvement philosophy. So you just have to be open to being flexible that, hey, we're going to adjust as needed. I used to go into a panic when something didn't work. And then I just, I live a much happier life now because I'm like, oh, okay, I know a better way now. I'm evolving, I'm growing, I'm doing it better. Here's some of the tips for managing those virtual employees. Make sure you've got the ground rules and expectations in your employee handbook. So that handbook is such an important document that, you know, you, you don't have a legal requirement to keep it, but it's going to help you stay compliant. It's going to set expectations. It's going to make it so much easier to communicate your culture, your vision. Uh, it's, I think, a really critical thing. No matter what the size of your medical practice is, you should have an employee handbook. And it also ensures that you're going to uh, show everybody, hey, I treat everybody fairly in my practice. You're very consistent. All of all the expectations are put in there and they see that, oh, they have policies in place about these things. I know they're gonna treat us all the same. You provide schedules and expectations on task completion. I, you know, myself have had to work on this. I actually just spoke with someone last week who's working on a project. And this morning I realized I never told her when it was due. And I don't know why that is virtually sometimes that I skip a beat on that, whereas if someone's in my presence, but making sure that if they're virtual, they know, hey, here's what it is, here's when I expect it, that you're never slacking off on that, on those expectations, and training, training, training. Um, if you are doing any kind of new technology, give them the time to learn it so that they are confident about it, they feel that support. I know employees really appreciate if you say, can you take an hour? And, and you, that hour of time, I pay for that to you know, learn this new software and making sure, again, I talked about this a lot, but it's so super important. You're compliant with state laws for each remote employee. And this is just to kind of wrap up simple to say, hey, it's easy to keep your workplace compliant because you're gonna organize all of your paperwork, especially your, especially your new hire paperwork. Um, there is, one, that's one thing I definitely want to add is when you organize your new hire paperwork and you have things like an I-9 that has some personal information on it, it needs to be separate 
from the file that would have their application or their resume and things like that. So when you organize new hire paperwork, make sure that the files are kept appropriately like that. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything, you know, they ha they'll have a W-4 uh, that would be kept in its right personnel uh, file as well. And this is the displayed required posters um, tip I have for you. And this is something that I just learned too. When we have the um, like the labor law posters, the requirements that you have to have posted in your workplace, that was usually easy when we were all coming together in the same place. But now so many of us are virtual. People may wonder, well, how do I make sure that they are getting those required workplace posters? So I actually went digging for this myself because I thought, well, if you can email it, is that going to satisfy the requirement? And it necessarily does not, I found out. I also wondered what they had recommended at one point is if you're a large employer, you can house it somewhere on your website where your employees go to for information. I'm not that large of an employer that I have that. So I actually called one of our certified HR professionals and I said, hey, what, what do I do for my remote employees to make sure I'm compliant on the workplace poster? And their recommendation was to actually, you can email it, but to send a physical poster to them and mail it and say, you can keep this in your workplace, wherever it's best for you. So then you're satisfied that requirement. And I, I, I mean, this just shows you like how HR has been changing along the world with us, right? Like we used to be able to put that poster up in um, our practice, but now we've got to make sure our remote employee actually has one in their home office and making sure that you have that handbook and in the handbook talking about a process for complaints. So if an employee isn't happy, you need to let them know, hey, we have a process for you to let us know that. Because if um, they keep it inside, that's never going to be good. It's not just that it's a risk for you, but you want people to have a process to share when things aren't right. And you also want to make sure that you have harassment training provided for if you have um, especially several employees. And um, because there, it isn't just within the workplace sometimes that people are made uncomfortable when they're working for you. And, and so you have to ensure that they feel safe and that they feel like they're comfortable do, to do their work and you're creating a really wonderful environment for them to do that. I'm just briefly going to talk about some of the legal obligations. I don't want it to like, um, sometimes it can scare or overwhelm, but it is critical to understand that employment laws affect your practice. And as an employer, you're expected to know them. And we saw that the violations can expose you to lawsuits and government pe penalties. So there's different federal laws and state laws. And the federal ones prohibit any adverse employment action based on race, color, sex, including pregnancy, age, national origin, disability, military service, and the state and local laws, which often prohibit discrimination based on marital status, sexual orientation, as well as other factors contained in the federal. So I think um, a lot of us are pretty aware of those, but just remember as an employer, you have to be um, very, very comfortable in how you are managing employees and making sure you're being compliant with those laws and that you understand that um, so much of how you manage your employees is critical to being, you know, it's at, at that HR and blur being compliant with them them. So it isn't just all about the legal side of it as well. Um, I know I, it's so important in HR to talk about compliance and laws and things like that, but good HR practices, it's more about just than avoiding lawsuit or fines. It's about being an employer of choice and making it easier to attract, retain, and grow top talent in the field. Because 33% of new hires they're looking for a new job within six months of being hired. And that statistic kind of is frightening in a little way. So one third of people started a new job and they already started you know, looking again and you don't want that to happen to you. You want to make sure that you re maintain that employer of choice. You're attracting the right ones, you're retaining them and you're growing that top talent in the field. And I think it's important to you know, express that these effective HR programs, they make you money. They can um, increase sales growth by 22%, faster profit growth by 23, and lower turnover by 67. And that to me is just so compelling to see the impact it has on turnover. So your greater employee retention 
is going to absolutely mean you're going to have better patient retention. You're going to have higher productivity. So for us, that is a lot about that better engagement in a patient visit. And just, I don't know, I, I can talk pretty fast, but just pausing for a moment and thinking about the employee who absolutely loves where they work every day. They are learning and they're growing. They're getting people better. They support your vision, your mission, your culture. They're the one meeting with your patient and that absolutely impacts that patient visit and it keeps that patient. And now your patients are going to tell all their friends about this place they love going. They love this practice. They love all the people that work there. And that's going to impact your operating income. And it also impacts employee absenteeism. And I always thought about this for me. I know in some of my other jobs on Sunday night, that feeling that you have of dread I thought that I don't ever want someone who works with me to feel that way. And that I wanted to create a business that on Sunday night, they do, you know, they're getting ready for the week, but it's not with dread that I want them to look forward to coming to work. And I think that if um, we all aspire to that, it's going to make the world a better place. Okay, so I've gone over when you're hiring, you're vetting, you're screening, you're bringing them on in a great way, you're making sure you're, you're keeping them, you're growing them, you're developing them. And now the last stage of our cycle is saying goodbye. And that's the termination. And there's two types that we have. One is voluntary. Um, it, I have often seen that people do not get it in writing when it's voluntary. And I cannot emphasize enough, that's not a good idea. In my early days, I used to go to a lot of unemployment hearings and there would be a question as to why that person left and the employer didn't get it in writing and I'd have to go to bat and explain um, as to you know, how that they provided their resignation. So no matter, you know, sometimes people have been working with you forever and you're a friend and they're moving on and it's all good, but get it in writing so there's never a question. It's always in their file to refer back to. It's the involuntary that gets a little bit uh, you know, more heavy because it can expose your practice to potential liability and put your reputation at risk if it isn't managed correctly. So I recommend that you always review it with a certified HR professional or a lawyer. It is worth your investment to do it. Uh, you know, you saw some of the costs that can be involved if you don't manage it uh, appropriately. So, and honestly, like if you've gone through your performance performance management process appropriately, you should have everything in place leading up to it. That it's, you know, for me, when I used to do management trainings in the large organizations, I always said, You're, it should never be a surprise. I mean, that employee has verbally been warned. They had a, a first, a second warning. They've had a probation. Um, my teams never had a, you know, there, it just wasn't a surprise. They knew because uh, we really wanted to get that behavior turned around, right? The manager worked on it. They were documenting it. They were meeting with them. So shouldn't be surprised. But even in that situation, our managers never, never had a termination until they reviewed it with one of us. And so make sure that you don't ever do that until you review it with a lawyer or a certified HR person. Always, again, I know I'm sorry I'm bringing this up again, but those state labor requirements, it's a big deal. I did this presentation a while ago and one of the practice owners says, geez, I wish I would have seen this a year ago because um, they had an involuntary termination and they figured that, well, we'll just put their vacation, et cetera, and their last payout with the next payroll that's coming in a week and a half. And that disgruntled employee filed a claim and that practice owner had to pay a $7,000 fine because in their state, an involuntary termination required a paycheck within 24 hours. So again, if you'd reviewed that, if he had reviewed that with someone, a professional, they would have maybe said, hey, check that you don't have a, you know, a check ready. And then always have a plan in place for the meeting. A checklist is critical. Uh, geez, I'm just thinking, I just thought about when I was first out of school and my first real HR job, they sent me uh, to close plants, manufacturing facilities. And that was probably one of the scariest things I ever did. And I just know that one of my pitfalls in that situation was not having a plan in place for each meeting. Um, because you, you just, there's some people who are emotional that might throw you off and you really need to be prepared about what you're going to say. And you should have a checklist and you should have it laid out as to everything that needs to be done 
to terminate that employment because you have to have, it's an organized, efficient process. It's compliant. It's been reviewed. And the last thing, it has to be an, a need to know. And this is across all industries. I've seen people violate this. But you have to make sure that you are not violating their privacy in any way and sharing the details of their termination with anyone who does not have a need to know, right? So if you're getting ready to term them in your practice, who has to know about that? Who really has a need to know? If you have an IT person, they would need to know because they're going to have to shut off their systems. Um, if your practice manager clearly would have to know because they're going to have to get that last check ready, et cetera, et cetera. But when the time comes that you have to notify the rest of the staff, all they need to know is that employee is not here any longer. Um, and then a plan in place of how we're going to cover up their work or cover their workload and how we're going to rehire. That's all. Just think of that need to know. And these are all the things um, I want to go back to about becoming that employer of choice um, to make sure that when you do have to hire again, you're attracting those right people by hiring right for the skills that they have and the culture fit, um, setting those clear expectations. People need to know why. Uh, people want to know why. And I think that is one of the things I've seen over the last 20 plus years is a pitfall for a lot of employers is they forget just to communicate with their staff. Because when you let them know, oh, this is why we're hiring somebody else. We have more patients or we need more efficiencies or this is why we're switching to Rupa because it's way more efficient to put all of our, our labs in one place, et cetera. Always letting them in the know and giving the, the why and saying, hey, um, we're going to expect you to be able to use this new platform, but we're going to give you training on it. But we want to know that you're going to have, we want you to know, we expect you to know this training by when, and that we have a mentor in place and um, being consistent. I, I know I sound like a broken record a little bit, but this is really important that you leave this with those kind of words that I keep saying all the time and knowing, oh, I know I can do this. I know that um, I can set clear expectations. I'm going to have the processes in place. I will absolutely make sure I'm always training and mentoring. I will treat everybody fairly. I know how important that is. I'm going to document the performance, update the job description, and I'm going to reward them. And this is the, a really important thing to remember about reward. It's not always monetarily, especially today. If we look at what's happening with our labor market, and I don't know if you've seen some of the people refusing to go back into the office, that they don't want to work on site, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you need to think about like, what is that employee's why? You know, what is it that they really, what's the reward for them? What is sometimes if I might be in the, in the right salary range, but maybe what they really want is two days of telehealth. You know, what is going to work best for them I've seen so many creative things where someone wanted to come in one hour later because it was really important to them to drop their kids off at school. And that was such a huge bonus for that employee. They, I mean, it just made them feel even more committed to the practice that they were willing to let them do that and adjust schedules of others to do, um, to allow that to happen. So when somebody does something really great, when you're small, uh, you may not be able to always reward in a monetarily way. What are other ways that you can reward them? Think creatively and out of the box, find out what their why is and go at it from that angle. Because once you start building this reputation as a top employer, it gets out there. Um, and I can tell you, because I've been doing this for so long, that it absolutely will reflect like wildfire when you're a top employer. But on the flip side of that, if you don't have a great reputation, it can make it really hard for you to recruit. Uh, when we present an, a, an opportunity to a candidate, what's one of the first things that they're going to do is they're going to Google that practice and they're going to look at the website and they're going to look at the people on it and they're going to look at the Google reviews from your patients. And they might even go to Glassdoor if you're on there and look at reviews from former employees. It's a really, really important thing to think about about your online presence out there because it can impact your ability to recruit top talent. And also one thing I've seen often from some of my interviews is that disgruntled staff can talk about you at practices. I mean, at conferences, I'm sorry. Uh, this is, you know, this actually kind of surprised me a little bit because we were having a tough time recruiting for something. And when I finally started to connect with some of the candidates and, and dig into the why, because I couldn't quite understand it, it's because they were at a table and it kind of, you know, they heard something and it, it, it spread. So 
kind of going to the top of that slide, you want to be a top employer. You want to maintain that great reputation because we are a small field still and everyone is very connected and it will spread if you're not. And it can make it really hard for you to recruit if there are, you know, some things out there saying that you weren't a top employer for a certain person. And this I want to talk about is that HR is needed more than ever um, because diversity and inclusion have become more important as we have all seen. Understanding COVID in the workplace and outstanding employees are truly a rare, rare gem. You, we want to retain them. We've seen the cost of turnover. Um, you know how hard it is to train people and take it one step further, training people in our field Wow, like it's even so much more complex. Um, think about in medicine, you know, people have to know certain things and then they have to know the systems in place for that practice, but you bring them into yours and now they have, have to understand all the labs that are involved, the different chronic illnesses and how you address them, the paperwork involved with getting a, a history and a timeline on them. There's so much more training, really, really important to um, make sure that you retain those ones who, who you've put that training into. And here's my final words of wisdom. And again, I promise I try to make it always simple. If you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. That is such a key thing. And my first job out, the head of HR took me aside and he said, hey, let me give you a few tips. And this is one of the ones that he gave me that I never, ever forgot. And it's so true. If you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. If you if you ever get challenged on a situation and you were brought in for, you know, even an unemployment claim or anything else, if it wasn't in writing, it's he, sh he said, she said, and you don't want to be in that boat. And you want to make sure that you always set expectations, you're consistent and fair, and that you do it with heart. Because this is, you know, why I love it so much. I really, really, really believe HR is the heart of your practice. Your team should feel safe, heard, and appreciated. And when they feel like that, and they're bringing that energy every day to your practice, your staff, well, they directly impact your patients and retaining your patients and attracting your patients. So I know that you are a business owner and you absolutely have to understand how to maximize your efficiencies and processes. You have to stay compliant. You certainly don't want to be in any kind of a legal landmine situation. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, we're all in this because we want to help people. And it really is all about that heart piece of it. And this HR, it's the heart of your practice. So where can you go for HR questions? Clearly, you know, I'm gonna tell you that you should go to Integrated Connections because we have this super great HR support center. Here it is laid out in these categories where we have all the, the HR forms I talked about, the job description, handbook, um, making sure you know of changes that happen in the law. Uh, once you're a member of our platform, you're going to get a weekly newsletter. You'll get a monthly one. I mean, it's pretty amazing uh, that you stay on top of all of it, but I know you're managing a practice. I know you're getting people better. I know you're changing the world out there and you can't remember it all. So you also get 12 hour support every day, live HR person. So if you are developing that handbook and you want to put certain things in there for your practice, you can call an HR person and have them talk to you about that, even a job description. The templates are there, but you might want to customize it a little bit for a specific role you're recruiting for. Call that HR person. And also we have online community meetings once a month for all of our members to share best practices. And because I think it's um, just so important because we're such a unique you know, right, niche in this medical space. And I think it's super helpful if we come together once a month and we can kind of talk about our pain points as well, share those best practices. All these areas, there's certified HR pros that are online waiting for you, skilled in this that can help. And there is how you can find us. Um, there's our website. There's all the information about our HR support center there. We also have a job posting platform. And um, let's see, my little plug about that, we have an email that goes out, two emails that go out every month, and one of them is just a jobs announcement to 7,000 subscribers. Our job board has incredible SEO. It's found by anybody looking for a job in the field, and it is a partner um, ship program with the Institute for Functional Medicine, and we also have recruitment services. So if you want to sign up for our bi-monthly newsletters, you can do that on our website and we'll send you updates on all that information. And there you go. That um, I apologize for running long on it, um, but 
I'll see now maybe if Anthony has any questions for me. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was a great presentation. You are fine on time. You gave some really good information today on the intricacies of human resources that I think can often be overlooked. So we have some time now for our Q&A and received a few questions. So let's start with the first question here. And that is, can I require employees to give notice? Uh, they said that there are only three people in my practice. If someone quits without me giving time to hire and train, my practice would be severely impacted. So uh, can they require employees to give notice? Well, that's a good question. And no, you cannot require them to give notice. And I know that might feel a little bit frustrating because in the handbook and an offer letter, you'll talk about at will. Um, you know, I, every state, most everyone will say at will and when they hire somebody that either person can terminate at will, but you can't require that they give notice. But if you put something in your handbook about how that you would ask that they would provide two week notice, et cetera, I mean, that is something you could certainly do. Um, and something else that just popped in my head is that again, that consistent thing, because I have seen some people say that in order to get a good reference from us, you will need to provide this amount of notice, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just make sure that when you do that, you are consistent in that with every employee who terminates, that you are providing them with that same information as well. So you cannot require that they give you notice, but you certainly can ask of it. You could certainly put it in your handbook that you ask that, that, hey, to leave in good standing, we ask that you provide this a certain amount of notice, um, and then I'd also put in there that for professional references that we ask that they, you know, I would ask for a waiver that you can receive those that somebody signs for that so that you're protected and you're being consistent in how you address it with everybody. Great question. Amazing. Thank you so much for that answer, Lisa. Next one is we want to hire a new clinician, but as a contractor, since it's just two days per week, are we able to do this? Uh, HR is such a great area because there's a lot you have to think about before you hire a contractor and you have to make sure that you are being compliant with not only, I mean, there are two, there's the Department of Labor and the IRS you've got to be compliant with and whether they're a contractor or an employee. And so there are tests that you can take and you write down um, if they are doing a job that other people are doing there, et cetera, et cetera. It is so complicated. I would, this is one thing I actually see a lot of practices do that they maybe not want to do. And that's hiring clinicians that are contractors because that can be questionable. If they are doing the work that you do yourself, that can be questioned. And um, I get it. They're only there two days a week. Um, but if it's a service that you provide, you may need to still be paying them as an employee. Uh, again, I'm not wanting to give out any legal advice, but I would tell you that um, it's a really, it's something a lot of states take very serious. I know in Colorado, a friend of mine was fined $25,000 because they felt like that person was paying contractors that should have been employees. And I'll be honest with you, I was shocked because I would have deemed them as contractors as well. So it's something that you'll want to check. You can do the due diligence yourself by showing you did the work to check off. Are they doing the work that, let's say, for example, you hire someone to do a website contractor, right? You don't do websites. You're a clinician. So that's not going to be a violation. Um, if you hire someone to do your marketing, you don't do, that's not what you do, right? You're, you're treating patients. So that's not so much in question. But once you bring somebody on and does the job that you're doing, it's something you're going to want to review with someone. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I think piggybacking a little bit off of that question is you had touched on the salary ban a few different times. Are the state laws applicable um, to both contracted practitioners, 1099, as well as W-9 salaried employees? Are they about the same? Oh, wow. That's a, a fantastic question. And that one, I would probably, especially whenever it comes to any kind of a state law, I won't ever give a definitive answer across the board. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that if you are posting a job, it's for an employee typically, right? Um, 
So that is where you absolutely should look at if you need to post that salary range. And in fact, I just saw in June, I think it's Connecticut changed their stance on it. And they're now saying you have to disclose salary ranges. So this is changing so often. As far as the contractors, I can't speak with confidence to that one um, because it isn't an employee and it's not, you know, normally that's something I would definitely check with an HR certified professional who's in the state that could do answer that one. Amazing. Thank you for that, Lisa. And one last one here. We have good reason to suspect employees are taking supplements without purchasing them, even though we give them a discount in our practice. What can we do about this? Oh, that's a great one. Um, a really good one. So first of all, the first thing that pops in my head is consistency. Um, if you feel like uh, we're going to address this right now, and it's been going on for a while, then you need to think about, well, why haven't we not addressed it in the past? And why have we decided to do it right now? And who we're going to pick to do that? And so if you single one person out, and they know that their um, peers have been doing it, they're going to question, why did you single me out? Um, so I'm going to back up on the handbook. You should have uh, uh, some policy in place that states in your handbook, we provide a discount to our employees of X percent on our supplements. Um, and you should have a process in place of how they get those. And, and it's not that they just take it themselves and they, you know, the front office knows the front office should be getting the supplement. So there's not a question about that. And then it's all about setting that expectation, right? There's a process in place. It's in your handbook and it's not a concern. So if you're really upset and you think that somebody took a case of them and it's egregious enough that we want to proceed with it, then you have to do an investigation and you have to make sure that you have proof. Was there a video of it? Um, you, you are going to get challenged if that staff member knows of anybody else that did it. And they're like, whoa, 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 you know, Susie did that two months ago, but you're not addressing that. So it's again, consistency, expectations. So if it were me, I would come out in the next staff meeting and say, hey, you know what? We think we need to manage this better. Want to make sure it's clear that um, you all get this discount. And, and when you are getting supplements, it has to go through the front office. She'll check them out for you. We've updated our handbook and have you sign here that you're aware of this policy and that that's how we're going to do it going forward. That way it sets you up so that you, you know, and it's really, it's, you, I don't know that you want to handle it like a retail outlet situation, right? And retail is going to be handled a little bit different, but like, what's the culture of your organization, how you want to handle that? Because I hear it happens a lot because people don't have processes in place to make sure it doesn't. Thank you so much for that, Lisa. What a great question and answer session. And we are running out of time here. So thank you everyone for attending the live class today. Big shout out to Lisa McDonald and Integrated Connections. You did an amazing job and we all hope to see you on the next live class.